Our next presenter is James Miller, who's going to be talking about Formula One in Watkins Glen, sporting gentlemen in a small town. So we'll get Jim set up here and we'll be ready to go. So I, I should forewarn you that my horoscope this morning said that um, doing a public presentation between Halloween and Day of the Dead is not advisable. So, <laughs> just warning. The 20-year history of the U.S. Grand Prix at Watkins Glen was bookended by two dramatic events. The first was the approval in August of 61 for the event to take place, leaving only six weeks before the October race date. The second occurred in the spring of 1981 when Formula One at the Glen was removed from the racing calendar due to its inability to pay participants from the previous race. A year later, the track was sold at a bankruptcy auction. Over time, it became clear that what made both the first race possible and the apparently sudden demise inexplicable was the remarkable collaboration between organizers and Glen residents. Local civic leaders and racers found common cause with villagers of all sorts to bring about an annual international extravaganza that drew hundreds of thousands of spectators to what remains the longest running venue of Formula One Grand Prix racing in the US. Three times, Formula One drivers voted the Glen the best organized race of the season. It was cooperation between these two distinct groups organizers and local residents that made it all possible. The truth of this familiar claim is not denied by adding a paradoxical complication, that in the end, the group's differences were stronger than their shared interests. This may have been discovered only too late, and that's what I'd like to argue today. In 1969, Cameron Argetsinger proposed to the Watkins Glen Grand Prix Corporation that he and private investors buy the track in order to finance the continuing improvements necessary to hold Grand Prix racing. His proposal was rejected, and Argetsinger left the organization. 
This, it turned out, was the beginning of the end, even though a full decade of racing remained. My view is that Argit Singer and his allies understood road racing in general, and the Grand Prix in particular, in ways ultimately at odds with local members of the corporation and maybe some villagers. I'm going to label these two groups sporting gentlemen and residents of a small town. My point is not to assign blame, but to offer an explanation that goes beyond mere finances for, for what many of us see as a tragic outcome. Sporting gentlemen brought an orientation to road racing that had relatively little to do with the geographic location of a circuit or its benefits to a local community. They were primarily about masculine competition in the context of highly ritualized upper class games with serious but amateur traditions. These were learned in prep schools, private colleges, and Ivy League universities, in yacht clubs and country clubs, and in sports like golf, dressage, sailing, and the like. They were cosmopolitans, attracted to the involvement of European cars and drivers in American racing. Many possessed the business savvy of wealthy people and had a feel for both the scale of capitalization and political skills required to pursue road racing. Early road racing circuits were necessarily located in the rural countryside, of course, but were nearly always near metropolitan areas where sporting gentlemen lived. So, Lime Rock in 56, well, that's New York. Bridgehampton, 57, the other side of New York City. And Elkhart Lake, 59, in Chicago. Small town people were less likely to be racers were by definition rooted in their village, happy to volunteer their efforts that in turn produced benefits for the community. Maybe they were possessive about keeping the Grand Prix synonymous with the people of Watkins Glen through maintaining what they saw as local control of the event. Here's how I'll try to make my case. First, the small town. This will necessarily be a broad brush treatment of the American small town, especially in the second half of the 20th century, with reference to the, Glen, to the Glen and a few key local organizers of different sorts. <clears throat> Next, a presentation of sociologist Digby Boltzell's sporting gentleman notion and three organizer racer biographies that I think illustrate it. Third, a too brief account of the fatal collision between sporting gentlemen's sensibility and small town attitude that ultimately brought an end to Formula One at Watkins Glen. And lastly, some counterf counterfactual historical fun focusing on Cameron Argetsinger and the recent development of Formula One Grand Prix racing. The American small town has a double identity, one mythical and the other historical. The first is profoundly nostalgic, a celebration of an idealized past. The other is more complicated. One historical fact is at the turn of the 20th century, about three quarters of Americans lived in small towns. And perhaps out of this widespread experience grew an outside imaginary significance. In fact, a study in the tw of 20s and 30s fiction in widely circulating magazines found that farms and small towns were depicted as enjoying a way of life whose essential goodness contrasted with the evils lurking in big cities. But as early as the 1880s, there was concern for the future of small towns that were bypassed by commercial routes or emerging industries. And around the time of those magazine stories, the census reported that for the first time, city dwellers constituted the majority of the US population. Especially during the post-war period, the rural small town was under existential threat. Industrialized agriculture, transformation into bedroom communities, out-migration in search of better opportunities. Greatest population loss occurred from the 30s through the 70s. One estimate is that between 1950 and 1970, 
Towns the size of the Glen lost one-third of their local uh, retail businesses. In the early 50s, one of the most important American community studies took place nearby in the wonderfully named small town of Cander, New York. Arthur Vidich and Joseph Benzman described a kind of collective delusion that Cander was actually the master of its own feet, fate. They also revealed a shared illusion of democracy when actually a limited number of influential citizens called the shots and when church members organized most of the town's public life. They termed the crisis of the small town modernization, by which they meant an often unwelcome intrusion of outside influences that were imposing new ways of living. These inescapable authorities ran the gamut from radio and TV to national retailers to state-level offices of education. Watkins Glen would not have been immune from these unsettling dynamics around the time that road racing arrived. Part of racing's allure, all the way through the F1 years, was surely a manageable antidote to forces that threatened a deeply established, rewarding small-town way of life. Watkins, as it was long called, shares the features of many other small rural towns of upstate New York. For decades, however, schooners and steam ferry boats crisscrossed Seneca Lake, facilitating local travel and trade and bringing visitors. By the end of the 19th century, the boats had been replaced largely by the railroad, which then brought international guests to the curative waters of the very grand Glen Spring Sanatorium and Hotel. Next door to its 300 acres, New York established a state park in 1906. Its centerpiece is a 400-foot deep gorge that, along with a score of waterfalls, was given pride of place when the town literally changed its name in the 1920s to Watkins Glen. During the Grand Prix years, the Glen's population was less than 3,000. Except for the unusual production of salt from brine wells, the local economy depended on tourism, agriculture, and retail. The first bank was built in 1922, the first cinema two years later. The municipal building, a New Deal project, housed the fire and police departments, and the mayor's office, and the court, and also the library. Another depression era intervention was the Civilian Conservation Corps, which established several local camps where young men worked to improve the state park, making it more accessible and more beautiful. Jean Argetsinger, in her history of the local Catholic Church, says that the Erie Canal and the local Chemung Canal, and later the railroads, brought waves of immigrants to the Glen to work as loaders of coal barges, stonemasons, farmers, and at the hotel jobs. First the Irish, and then in larger numbers, Italians joined the descendants of the early British settlers. The primacy of tourism, a seasonal economy that encouraged openness to visitors, was threatened when the luxurious Glen Springs, founded in 1890, closed its doors during the war. After Cornell briefly housed GI Bill students there, it became a Catholic seminary and high school for 20 years, and then was abandoned. Perhaps the loss of the resort was an incentive to try to extend tourism into the autumn, which was a rationale for October road racing and, and later Formula One. During the 50s and 60s, regional tourism promotion became an organized effort using Finger Lakes to brand the area. It emphasized boating and camping and stressed the ease of transportation afforded by the new interstate highways. Cornell University even established an Office of Regional Resources and Development. Cornell is about 20 minutes from here, maybe a bit more. Here are biographical sketches of five men with different sorts of local identities who were involved in racing. Donald Brubaker brought his five children to the Glen in the 40s to start a new life after the death of his wife. He had connections here. New Yorker cartoonist Sam Cobine, a friend of um, Cameron Argetsinger's, 
and lived in the village was his cousin. Brubaker was a graduate of Penn's Law School, but he became proprietor of the Seneca Lodge, whose food he grew organically. The lodge was famous for housing F1 teams and its raucous post-war celebration. Active in promoting local tourism, Brubaker became president of the Chamber of Commerce. Malcolm Curry came to the Glen from Massachusetts and with a partner bought local newspapers beginning in 1951, which they published until 1987. He later succeeded Argett Singer as executive director of the Grand Prix Corporation. Henry Valent was the son of Italian immigrants and a native of the Glen. He graduated from Cornell and its law school, later establishing his own practice in town. He was co-owner of the local AM and FM radio stations, and like other leaders, he was active in a number of organizations, from the Chamber of Commerce to the Board of Education and the area hospital. Liston Kuhn was born in a rural hamlet near the Glen. His father was a farmer and mail carrier and his mother a teacher. After a short period following the war teaching school, he, had, uh, he attended Cornell's law school and he practiced law in the Glen. Later, he was elected district attorney and county judge and served for decades in the Air Force Reserve and was active in the county Republican Party and other organizations. Joe Francisi's parents were Italian immigrants. He and his wife, Helen, built tourist cabins during the 20s, uh, sorry, the late 30s on the family farm along the lake. After the war, they established the Glen Motor Inn, which featured 40 rooms, a restaurant, and a pool. It became a storied lodging place for Grand Prix teams and operated until just a couple of years ago. They donated land that became the local golf, golf course where Joe taught Formula One drivers how to play the game. He, too, was president of the chamber, and their son, Vic, was himself a racer and a racing team owner. Sporting gentlemen is Digby Baltzell's term for the tradition of gentlemen amateurs, upper class Protestants mostly, who followed conduct imported from aristocratic England. At its core is the idea that, quote, games demanded loyalty, self-discipline, and a sense of command and accomplishment. Their code of conduct stress, quote, winning is less important and playing hard and fairly. In the States, the newly formed national upper class of the 19th century steel and railroad economy imbued these values in its sons by means of Episcopal boarding schools in New England and the originally Calvinist colleges of Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. So to say sporting gentlemen implies social position, a competitive but rule-abating masculinity, a deeply socialized sense of how to play well certain valued games and a shared sense of camaraderie among the select few. Baltzell even suggests that underpinning this orientation is the unstated view that sporting gentlemen possess the natural fitness to rule. Three biographies of sporting gentlemen capture its varieties. The closing weeks of the 1939-40 New York World's Fair featured a race of 18 mostly European sports cars over a seven-tenths mile circuit uh, between the exhibition buildings. The winner, who averaged 35 miles an hour, was 26-year-old Frank Griswold Jr. Months before, he owned a car that ran in the Indy 500. And in 1948, Griswold won the first road race at Watkins Glen. He ran a machine shop outside Philadelphia and became the North American importer for Alfa Romeo, Weber carburetors, and Nardi steering wheels. Frank Griswold Jr. grew up on the family's 34-acre estate on Philadelphia's main line. In Harvard's class of 1894 25th anniversary report, his father identified himself as a retired banker and broker. He, he would have been in his 40s. And his club, as the Racket Club, which today says, quote, continues to be one of the most prestigious private city clubs in North America. Griswold's parents and grandparents appeared in the 1917 Social Register. They were said to season in Bar Harbor, 
and Newport, a Palm Beach, and in Europe. Finally, it seems likely that the extensive Wikipedia entry for the Griswold family refers to Frank's relatives who first arrived from England in 1639. William Milliken Jr. was born in 1911 in Old Town, Maine, a town known for canoe building and paper making. He and his buddies entertained themselves by constructing various kinds of vehicles, including an airplane. Milliken's academic performance at the neighboring University of Maine persuaded his parents to find money for two years at MIT, where he, in 1934, earned a degree in aeronautical engineering and math. His long life, he lived to 101, was filled with remarkable achievements. His work for Boeing, carrying out high-altitude test flights, led to flight dynamic research at Cornell's lab in Buffalo. This soon expanded to research with GM on automobile control dynamics and passive safety. Two of his books on race car dynamics and chassis design are considered classic references. Milliken was an early official at the SCCA. With Cornell colleagues, he designed the Glen's first permanent track. And he served as chief steward at the Grand Prix races. Competing in more than 100 road races, included campaigning a 1932 four-wheel drive Miller at Pikes Peak. Carl Lud Ludwigsen named him Mr. Supernatural. Cameron Artgitzinger was born in 1921 in Youngstown, Ohio. <coughs> His father, James Cameron, uh, or J.C., the first, became general counsel and vice president of the steel company Youngstown Sheet and Tube. He was born and raised near Watkins Glen, where his parents had established a farm in the late 19th century. Cameron was the only child of wealthy, civically engaged parents, both of whom graduated from Cornell, where his father also attended law school. J.C. collected cars and owned a number of Packards. He taught Cameron, at age 12, to drive the country roads around the Glen where they had a summer place on the lake. Shortly before his 20th birthday, Cameron became co-owner of a Youngstown area Packard dealership, which closed a couple of years later when he and his partner were drafted. What is now Youngstown State University grew out of a 19th century YMCA school. In the 30s and 40s, it became Youngstown College and severed its YMCA roots. It was very local, a commuter school, financially supported by the president of Youngstown, Sheet and Teal, Tube, among others, and prominent people were members of its board, including J.C. Argetsinger. It was the logical place for Cameron to attend after the war when he was married with children. If he hoped to become a lawyer like his father, Youngstown College would have given him the necessary undergraduate degree without complicating his life or perhaps taxing his mind. Cameron's dream of racing on the streets and roads of Watkins Glen began about the time of his graduation. He would spread magazines on the living room floor to explore different possible circuits, maybe with thoughts of the Targa Florio and the Vanderbilt Cup swirling in his mind. Cars were a lifelong infatuation, and Cameron's daily drivers were Packards and Cadillacs. He also owned an MGTC, an Allard J2, a Bugatti Type 30, 35, a Healey Silverstone, and a Mercedes 300 SL. In 1970, when the Watkins Glen Grand Prix Corporation rejected by one vote his offer to buy the circuit, Cameron resigned as executive director, a post he'd held since 1955, replaced by Malcolm Curry, who had been press officer. Argus Singer soon left the corporation. His son Michael writes that Henry Valent pressured the board to vote against the proposal, saying this. Valent also falsely claimed that the race might be removed from Watkins Glen. During the late 20s, the, the Grand Prix Corporation embarked on projects to improve the track. These included a 4,000-seat grandstand, 
uh, expanding the pit lane facilities and enlarging the Kendall Tech Center. After the vote to retain nonprofit ownership, still more was done to modernize the track at very great expense. The circuit was lengthened by a mile and widened, and two new buildings were constructed. About seven miles of Armco barriers were built close to the circuit. This design later contributed to two driver deaths in 73 and 74. The GP Drivers Association demanded the barriers be removed or, or moved uh, to be um, moved back from the circuit. But the improvement project had already been funded by a $3.5 million bond plus the expense of another million dollars. Today, these figures would total a debt of $36 million. What was probably an early, slightly desperate sign of financial problems, along with unpaid bills, took place in July of 1973 when the track was rented for a weekend rock concert. Summer Jam, featuring big names like the band, sold 125,000 advance tickets. Eventually, attendance doubled the size of Woodstock to 600,000. Traffic was backed up for scores of miles and services were overwhelmed. Afterward, local people filed more than 20 lawsuits against the corporation. It's felt that Summer Jam damaged the collaborative spirit between track and village. During this time, Bernie Ecclestone's Formula One Constructors Association flexed its muscle against the FIA over regulatory and commercial issues and prize money awarded by organizers. It was a tumultuous time in the sport that put additional unprecedented pressure on Watkins Glen. After he won the final F1 race at the Glen, Alan Jones, who was also that year's champion, said, quote, sure, the Glen is a nice scenic track, but that doesn't mean we should have to live in the Stone Age. Henry Valent admitted that the race failed to break even during its last four years. But he also said this, whoops, not that, that. Two accountants separately reviewed finances and both concluded that conventional accounting practices had not been, had not been followed. And this led Cameron Argetsinger to remark, quote, why no one has blown the whistle on this business is hard to say. Adding that in his last year of the corporation, the race earned a $100,000 profit. Reflecting on the situation, I'm inclined to sum it up by employing two metaphors that I used last year. For sporting gentlemen, the Grand Prix was like a traveling circus. It came from faraway places once a year, bringing exotic entertainment and displaying advanced technologies, often seen for the first time. There was danger in the activities, which were often death-defying. Its visit was brief but exhilarating. It had no local link except to the fairgrounds it paid to use, and for the circus, this was just another stop in a season of travel facilitated by local organizers. For villagers, the Grand Prix may have been more akin to a county fair, which is supremely local, Except for the visiting amusement rides, the fair is all about displays of local good-natured competition, fruit and vegetable canning, tractor pulls, livestock breeding, and nostalgic objects like old-time farm implements. The long local history of the fair itself is proudly evident at every turn in posters, signage, and activities. Generations of local families participate. But a circus is not a county fair, nor is a fair a circus. Expecting one to be the other is bound to provoke a clash. The loss of the Grand Prix and the bankruptcy of the track had negative consequences for individuals on both sides of the local issue. Henry Valent and Malcolm Curry raised money by mortgaging their houses. Valent died barely a year after the track was sold at 67. Curry was younger, but he too lived only to 67. After he left the corporation in 1970, Cameron went to work for Jim Hall on a project with GM. He then served as SCCA Director of Professional Racing and its Executive Director. But in 1977, at age 56, he returned to Watkins Glen to open a law practice. 
He died 31 years later. Argett Singer's full-time auto racing employment after leaving the track was brief, and he came home just in time to witness the corporation begin its grim slide into oblivion. He must have felt a deep sense of frustration and disappointment. It's hard to imagine that being a small town attorney afforded Argett Singer the same satisfaction as running F1 races. Michael Argett Singer reports that near the end of Cameron's life, a journalist asked if he regretted that NASCAR had replaced F1. NASCAR, by the way, first raced here in 1977. And this was Cameron's response. Well, true enough, but pretty bloodless and maybe masking the passionate feelings of a sporting gentleman. Racers like Cameron and volunteer villagers would surely agree that the unique reward of host hosting Formula One transcended mere commercial activity. From the mid-70s and after F1's departure from the Glen until 2017, when Liberty Media bought the sport, the U.S. Grand Prix raced at seven tracks, all but Indianapolis and Austin were temporary. And they hosted the race from one to eight years. Four times, there were four U.S. Grand Prix in a single season. Only at Coda, a new $300 million permanent track, did the race finally find something like a home. One reading of this is to say that it was chaotic and reveals an uneven, maybe declining, U.S. interest in Formula One. NASCAR and American open wheel racing were likely more popular then, with network TV coverage and Fortune 500 sponsorship. You could almost say there was U.S. Grand Prix racing before and after Watkins Glen, with neither comparing favorably with the Glen years until very recently. This raises the intriguing question, what if Cameron Argetsinger had bought the track. So consider these thoughts. There were public perplexity and disgruntlement when the race was lost. Valence and Curry's lives and maybe reputations were damaged. Cameron Argetsinger's full-time involvement in motorsports came to an end three decades before his death. None of these things might have occurred. The next years of Formula One transformed the sport, especially technologically with respect to engines, aerodynamics, and safety. TV coverage in the U.S. was sporadic, but in retrospect, F1 was maturing alongside new media like cable television that soon brought about the mediatization of sports generally. And finally, Formula One became a globe-spanning business. So could a successful U.S. GP have influenced these changes and made the sport more attractive to North Americans? If the USGP took place at multiple venues, there are now three, could Watkins Glen have been their owner or partner? Might this have given the Glen a seat at the table when Liberty bought the sport or offered it a role in sanctioning? And conversely, would Watkins Glen International be a different enterprise most of all, less dependent on NASCAR for big crowds and financing. And finally, in 1974, Cameron Argetsinger proposed a U.S. Grand Prix race through Central Park in New York City. Now think about that, if only. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. That was fascinating. I always liked Alan Jones until I heard that comment. Uh, Stone Age, come on. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Jim? Uh, I have a question about the relationship between uh, Mr. Vallant and Mr. Argetsinger, and why, why do you think that there was such, was, was there a history of bad blood there, or why, why was he so opposed to Cameron Argett Singer's purchase offer? So there's a great, great deal of speculation in this kind of analysis. Um, it's difficult to find records. Uh, for example, uh, where are the minutes to the corporation meetings where you might have seen a disagreement? Um, I think 
one could say from what is on the record, and even some of what I proclaim today, Valent was a very local guy who did very well for himself and probably had strong connections in the community, different from uh, Cameron, who arguably descends from a family who had spent more than a century here, uh, but was a kind of outsider and a, and a privileged guy. And there may have been something at the very, very personal level that had nothing to do with, you know. And I guess I would want to say that if any of that is the case, I'd, I want to try to locate it in this idea of, of a sporting gentleman, which I would say Cameron Argetsinger and the guys who initially set up road racing uh, shared. And then someone like Valent, smart, educated, uh, but, but very local in a, in a, in a different way. Uh, and I'm afraid that's the best I can do. There's also probably a danger in over-personalizing personalizing this kind of thing. Yeah. Someone else, please. No, I just wanted to clarify the two quotes that you attributed to Valent. On one hand, in, 19, in 11 years, he switched his um, point of view from private being bad to private being good. Just that's what you put I, up I there, right? I'd rather just let this, those quotes uh, stand alone. I mean, I, it was remarkable to see that whatever was going on. I mean, he just may have been very frustrated and angry at the end, and even, well, full stop. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Um, as far as you know, have there been any kind of clashes between sporting gentlemen and local places elsewhere, or is this a uniquely Watkins Glen phenomenon? Clashes between Valent and Argus? Uh, no, but specifically between the, the, the circus coming in and, the, and the, the, the local people of the area of whichever track they happen to be at. Oh, so other locations? Yeah, correct. Um, well, what I might pursue next is something called the Watkins Glen effect, where there's a claim that in the 50s, when road racing came to America and tracks like the three I mentioned, Bridgehampton and Lime Rock and so forth, um, th they were sort of part of a larger phenomenon that uh, where the, that the Glen had led the way and there was a kind of imitation and cross-fertilization. Now, would that mean there was uh, tension? Well, Bridge Hatman doesn't exist anymore, and a lot of that is due to um, people hating the noise and what have you. You can't race on Sundays at Lime Rock. Uh, so maybe this happened, but it wasn't fatal, and maybe that's the case because the stakes weren't as high as Formula One racing. That's an intriguing question. Because if you claim to be doing a, a case study, well then of what, and how about some other examples? Well, to the previous gentleman's point, I think Las Vegas was actually a great example of that, where at one point they blocked the view of the course for the walkway, right? So you're seeing sort of an urbanization where you're still creating a, an us and them, right? And so I guess my question would be, with the major circuits being in major cities, you know, how are we transitioning from this small town us and them to big city us and them? I think what I'm trying to describe was a different era and post-liberty, Formula One is something entirely different. It's a media spectacle. And these cities are knocking their doors, Liberty's doors down to have this opportunity for attention and money making and, and most of all celebrity presence. So it's sort of an apple, apples and oranges comparison. And maybe last year's Las Vegas race was kind of teething problems as they figured out how to organize things the best. The more interesting question about Vegas is that there, there was one years ago through a parking lot, and I, I'm forgetting the author's name, but it, it was heavily inflicted with or assisted by the mafia, <laughs> you know? So that would be more interesting, Vegas then and now, yeah. Sure. Thank you. You had br uh, brought up the possibility of, or that proper accounting methods weren't used in those final years. How did that play out in the town 
when I have to think that just brought in suspicion of theft and questionable use of, of proceeds and monies? Well, I think, again, there's a problem with lack of records. And when I've talked with people, they would say things like, well, sale of tickets was always pretty casual. Uh, there was even someone suggested there might have been um, phony tickets you know, produced and sold. Um, I, I think in a, in a way maybe some of this has to do with a conception of this whole enterprise. It's just you know, a bunch of friends who get together and do things that are good for the local people and, you know, and so forth. Um, was there criminal activity? Um, I don't know. And I, 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 the lack of records is really a, a difficult hurdle. And maybe in the end it doesn't matter because uh, the effect would, would be the same. Would, would anyone like to challenge the sort of argument that I've laid out? Is <laughs> okay, I'm not going to challenge, you, but as the, as the new archivist at the uh, International <laughs> Motor Racing Research Center, we're going to get you those records. That's, well, that's a promise. It sounds like you've just, just arrived the other day, right? There's <laughs> dusty boxes of things. That... Uh, okay, yes, I'm old enough. I was at one of the original Las Vegas Grand Prix in the uh, parking lot. Uh, did somebody else have a question? Did I step on somebody else here? I just oh, had a sorry. comment. Yes, Lynn. I'm going to challenge you good. when I make my presentation. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> You know, Ooh, stick around for that. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going out for lunch during that time. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I just want to say that that's the nature of this kind of work. None of us claims to have the truth. You know, it's a conversation that doesn't stop. So thank you. I, I would be honored. Uh, all I can say is somebody old enough to have attended a lot of those Grand Prix up on here. Uh, it, it was just a magnificent time of year. Uh, it, we, we geared up for it. It was great. Um, Vegas, the first Caesars Palace Grand Prix was really corny and fake and ridiculous. I was at Long Beach when they were still running Grand Prix cars and that was pretty cool. And uh, I liked Mossport a lot too. But this was still, not to sound like the old guy telling people to get off my grass, uh, this is really the rightful home of the U.S. Grand Prix. And that was a fascinating presentation, Jim, so thank you again very well, much. I can't, since you mentioned old guys getting nostalgic, I can't resist the reference to weather, um, everything you read about the Glen, you know, it's in the fall and the leaves are turning. I came here one year and it snowed. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>